and welcome to Money Control. I'm Rachita Prasad and I'm right now sitting at Siemens factory campus at Kalwa near Mumbai. And why am I here? Because I'm meeting somebody very special. Joining us today is Dr. Roland Bush, the president and CEO of Siemens Aging. And uh, while he's looking at the global operations, he's been traveling way too much to India. Thank you so much, uh, Roland, for joining us and uh, welcome to Money Control. Thank you very much and good to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, Roland, you know, I uh, I was just talking to your team and I understand this is your 20th trip since 2010 and it's your second trip in less than a month. First questions first, why is India so important for Siemens? Yeah, India is picking up momentum in development. We saw it in, the, in particular in the last three years. There's really a lot of going in it. You see a lot of... Um, infrastructure development, you see a lot of um, inflow of new products coming to be manufactured in the country. We have a government which is dedicated to bring more value added to India, made in India. And you see also transformation, transformation in terms of going more green, so CO2 reduction and, and going more digital. So this is saving for us. Another one is a big win for Siemens. We recently won a three billion order for locomotives. Um, so a lot of things are going on. Looking forward, the next five years, Siemens is on the top of, of our growing markets, Siemens markets. They go, India grows fast. So there are a lot of arguments why to be here again. Let's, let's take a step back. Uh, you are looking at global markets. You are present in, uh, what, 190 countries, if I'm not wrong. Sure. Um, the, uh, the kind of cues we are getting on the macros, IMF lowered the economic growth outlook for 2023. Although they are saying that uh, most of the countries may not slip into recession, but the fear is uh, lingering. What is your take on it? And especially when you're interacting with clients, what is the on-the-ground report that you can give us? Yeah. So, I mean, number one is when you talk about the economy in total, people were, were predicting a recession in Europe, in Germany, and in other markets. It is not that bad. I didn't expect it for Siemens because we are sitting on a huge order backlog. Um, our supply chains were very tight. So it's huge order backlog, supply chains, which are easy. Um, we have a very low unemployment rate. I mean, this is really for me an argument why I'm not so concerned about at least 2023. If inflation stays high mm -hmm. or 2023, 24 going onward, that might have an impact on private consumption. And this had a kick on effect, obviously on, on some markets. So at Siemens, we are more in the industrial, in the in the uh, direct investment space. So let's assume our car manufacturer sells less cars because the inflation rate is high. They still have to invest into the new manufacturing line for the latest and greatest electric car. They have to invest in battery manufacturing, and this is where Siemens comes in. So I'm I'm less concerned for our markets, but there's a likelihood that there's a line of line of slowdown due to high inflation rate going forward. When you're talking to clients, I mean, you have you have been in India last few days, right? And you have spoken to clients here yeah. as well. Uh, what is what is it you're picking up on? Are people, especially the private sector, uh, are they uh, a little confident about investments? I mean, because like you said, that you know there are some things that are evolving. So what what is it looking like? So the feedback I got when talking to, to local customers here, they they are talking about anything else but a recession. So it's really about growth, how to cope with the growth, but also at the same time um, using less resources. So using less energy and, and using less critical material because this is going to be tight. This is part of this energy transition. So therefore, the common theme I would say is there's a, quite, a, a, quite a positive perspective on the growth rates for India going forward. And customers, um, they are trying to figure out how they can cope with the growth and at the same time driving the productivity. This is where I believe uh, Siemens can come into place because we are automating and digitalization manufacturing sites or buildings. Um, and, and this is technology which can help our customers making their targets. In terms of, uh, you know, uh, in February, you actually revised the uh, uh, revenue guidance for Siemens AG globally. Uh, of course, Mixed signals happening all over the world. Uh, Indian growth, like you said, is still strong, and somehow we feel like uh, things should be okay given the demand that we are seeing. But what is giving you the confidence right now that uh, you are have actually uh, revised the growth guidance, and 
I mean, you do have a, you know, substantially strong, robust order book, but the pipeline, what is that looking like and where is this confidence coming from? So the confidence is coming from, as you said, our huge order backlog, which is ex exceptionally high, in particular also for short cycle businesses and the supply chain, which is easy. At the same time, talking about our Q1, we could, while growing very fast, also for our short cycle businesses, the digital industries was growing by 15% in Q1, smart infrastructure as well. So despite that, we even, for digital industries, we even increased our backlog. So that means there are still orders coming in on that high level. So that gives us a lot of confidence that we, that we will keep that pace um, for the fiscal year. Hence, we increased our guidance. Best of luck for that. And uh, That's good. talking of the digital business, I mean, that is something you have been very upbeat about. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we have been obviously uh, tracking what Siemens is doing. And you've also been very upbeat about what digital business could be in India. Yeah. And I think you said that it can amount to uh, the global business would amount to 20% of your total business sometime in the future. What, what kind of growth are you seeing globally and what kind of growth have you seen in India and what is the expansion plan on that? So what we, what we said, we want to grow our digital business by more than 10%, so outgrowing our, our other businesses, obviously. And we talk digital is software and digital services. This is a combination. So we believe this is a very grow, strong growth trajectory, which comes from a, a higher demands on the market. Why that? Because if you, if you make this a transformation, transformation for reducing energy consumption, transformation for going for higher productivity, what we can do is we combine the real and the digital worlds. It means we bring IT technology and OT technology, which IT is fair and OT is what sits on the shop floor. We bring software and hardware together and we leverage the capabilities which you have in the digital world, in the virtual world, we leverage it and bring it to the hardware. Give you one example. When we, we built a new plant, we built it twice. First, fully digital. The products, the manufacturing lines, the buildings, we optimize it. Then we build it. This shortens the time, so we can shorten the time by 30, 40% until we build it. We optimize it, we get it right the first time, and we have a higher productivity, higher space productivity. We can be much, much more flexible in producing more variants and we lose energy, yes, less energy, 20% or more or less energy. Once you have that and you use your digital twin in the operation space phase, then you can always optimize. So you can drive your productivity from a level of two, three, four percent to five, six, seven percent because right. you, you do that all the time and come up with great ideas, putting a new robot on the line, simulate it, you like it, build it, interrupt the line for an, a day and not a week because you know exactly what to do. This is what, what technology can do. You can do that on a green field when you build something new. And looking to Calvar here, where we are, you can do it on a, on a brown field, even a 50-year-old site as well. So we are using an existing, uh, existing manufacturing plant. We digitalize it, we build it also on a, on a virtual world, um, but then we build it and run it digitally, and you really can bring new products and produce them with a higher level of productivity. The digital business, do you think it actually got a boost from the COVID experience? Because uh, prior to COVID, everybody was talking about digital transitions as something that is in the future. Now, suddenly there seems to be, uh, you know, people are seeing the economic value of it. Has that got expedited? Yeah. My, my take is that COVID accelerated a trend, which was already there, but it accelerated. We could see that some customers, they were, they were, they were extremely happy when they saw that they had their, um, our technology in place because they couldn't access their sites. So they can do so many things remotely. We, for example, we could deliver when others couldn't because we had acceptance tests, which normally has been done by a customer coming to our sites and making an acceptance test. We had people running this, with glasses around and our customers were witnessing the test so we could make a test virtual for our customers. And they like it. And they say, why don't we do that normally as well? It saves travel time. It's much, much faster. We could deliver when others couldn't because we had a, a fully digitalized 
version of two plants and we could shift volume from one plant to the other wherever you have parts available and run that system in an extremely agile way. So there are many, many examples um, which have which showed a proof point that technology makes a difference. And obviously, once you have that, once you know that you can do that, you want to have it. Absolutely. Yeah. You've already made quite a bit of investment in the digital business globally. Yes. Help me understand what are the future investments looking like and how how does India fit into the larger scheme of things? Okay. So to, to put it in perspective, in the last 10 Ten plus years, we added more. We invested more than 12, 10, 12 billion in software in our software portfolio, um, and this makes us as one of the largest software companies in the world. It comes to industrial software, uh, we are maybe the largest one. So um, this is one element. The other one is we are continuously investing in our in our hardware, but it make it more connected, connected to the digital world, so we can get data from the shop floor and adding this data to our cloud application solutions and driving. We are investing 6.5 billion in R&D, which is 8% of our revenue, which is in absolute and relative terms more than our competitors, because we believe in, in technology and that this makes a big difference. This pattern you will see also going forward, that we are looking into the space, it's not only software which we're investing, we're also investing in our hardware, R&D, but also in, in uh, any kind of M&A, preferably, of course, in software and in connected hardware, so any hardware which, which creates data and which can connect to the cloud. And the same holds true for India as well. So we are we're investing in more and more also in R&D, in local R&D, and, and bring this technology to the Indian market. In terms of uh, your traditional business in the industrial space, I mean, you have done pretty well globally. Uh, India, what is the outlook on that business and the, what are the drivers here? I mean, in the last few months, the biggest orders you've got are from government. Uh, is that a trend likely to continue? Uh, I, we are firing on all cylinders. So we have a very strong digital industries business, so manufacturing sites um, pull from all markets. Um, is it traditional steel market, car manufacturing, but also new markets, batteries, um, there's more higher... Uh, higher value, more complex products coming to India, which need a more higher level of automation. But we see also a uh, pull from government spending, starting on rail infrastructure, uh, but also rolling stock. So, and also the healthcare market is, is, is a market which is growing very fast. So this is the good thing about India. Uh, we, are, we have, we have uh, all our portfolio here and we go full steam in all of them. Of course, you uh, banned a big bang order for the locomotives in India and uh... That was a that's a very exciting one. Uh, if you look at the railway space, the one thing that the industry is talking about is that the government wants to actually scale up uh, the railway infrastructure yeah. quite a bit. And one of the problems there is that we don't have enough capacity for wagons. And uh, what? How big is this an opportunity for you? And when you look at the local markets, because uh, some of the bids seem to be getting delayed. Uh, so is is there a mismatch between this three billion order? for locomotives was awarded in a record time. It took six months from the from tendering to giving the award. This is record also in industry globally. So therefore, if there's a, maybe a little delay in some of the projects, it's still fast speed. So there's really a good people in place. Also um, in, the, in the ministry, you see a lot of momentum there. They're really dedicated to get things out of the door and invest. That in turn is, is good for us. We are ramping up now our manufacturing as we speak. We have already manufacturing on the ground. We use also manufacturing from our customer from Wales. We, are, we would assemble our locomotives there. We have traction manufacturing here in India. We are building up our supply base as we speak. So therefore, and, and therefore we are looking for more. And that's interesting. And uh, clearly when the government is talking about high speed trains, I mean, it should start reflecting in the speed of uh, the tendering process itself. Absolutely. Uh, hope, hope that happens as well. But uh, when you are looking at the Indian market and, uh, you know, in terms of, I know your Indian team is uh, looking across sectors. Going ahead, 2023, 2024, what would be the key growth drivers and what are the sectors where you are already seeing strong demand coming in? So, um, number one is everything what, what makes, makes the economy going more green, more sustainable, will have an impact on the growth. I mean, is it, is it more renewables? Is it more the grid which you need, uh, the distribution grid as well? 
but also energy efficiency and the like. This is one thing. The other one is, I do believe that the government is very clear on made in India. So manufacturing in India, um, and as I said before, it's basic products, but it's more and more complex products, high-tech products, which need a different way of manufacturing, um, which, which, which uh, is, is the whole value chain. You will have a more impact of going electric in your um, electric vehicles, but also light duty, heavy duty, um, uh, including the charging aspect, actually charging aspects. So therefore, this, this is, some, I do believe this is a lot of growth coming from the industrial space, but also from the, from the infrastructure perspective. Buildings is another area, buildings and grids, because buildings are consuming 30% of the energy. And we see a lot of customers asking, um, how can I drive my footprint down or even creating transparency and then and take action from it. So again, it's, um, it's, it's, India is such a huge market that you say whatever is, is done in terms of developing going forward, it's, it's going for the full nine yards. Clearly, a lot is happening in India and you are very upbeat as well. So going ahead, if I were to ask you, what would be the investment plans for India? Are there any gaps you need to fill here? Would they happen organically or inorganically? Because you have made acquisitions in the past. So yeah. what is the strategy on that? Simple answer is, we, we, whether it's organic or unorganic, we, we do what, what, what's, what's good for Siemens, it's what's good for our customers and what, what drives our growth and competitiveness. We want to increase our market share in India, definitely. We have recently done an acquisition or CNS, which is electrical equipment. We are very happy about it. It's developing very, very well. But we are also investing organically. Um, we, are, we have uh, a lot of capacity since we invested in the last seven years. We invested more than a billion euros in India. So we have capacity. We can deliver. But if we keep on with that growth rate, which we have, um, there is there's more to come. And if I were to ask you the challenges, I mean, you know, when you are dealing with the private sector, which is still getting out of, uh, you know, the COVID and, uh, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, and we are in a high uh, interest rate scenario. And then there is the government, which is really the intent is in place and the plan is in place. But there are challenges, you know, how tenders are floated and by the time the orders come in, I mean, there is a substantial time that goes into that. So. Take, looking at the space that you're operating in, what would be the biggest challenge right now that you foresee for India? I do believe the biggest, biggest challenge is getting the, getting the right people uh, with the right education so that they can use modern new technologies in, in hardware, software, the digital space and real space and mechatronics, kind of like, but also software on our side, but also on customer side. Um, if, if we have the technology, but the customer doesn't have on the other side the capabilities to digest it and implement it. So uh, I would believe the biggest challenge would be bringing the right competences on the ground in order to really take benefits and the advantages of the technology Siemens can provide. A lot of the tech companies are uh, looking at a larger uh, captive uh, yeah. base here in India. And uh, you have a global strategy where you want to increase your software and hardware, uh, you know, contribution to the total business. Yes. Are you looking at uh, inc increasing your manpower in India? What's the plan on that? Yes, we do. And we have, for example, take mobility space. We, we have, uh, we, a couple of years back, we launched a strategy of bringing more engineering capabilities to India. We are ramping up and, and this, we are very happy about the, having that strategy because now we have a, a huge order backlog here, which we are going to execute with local engineers. Same holds true for any kind of software development, which we, which we can take advantage of. We have already a very strong foothold in, in Bangalore. And therefore, that, that's a trend which we keep on going um, and bringing more people also in the engineering space um, it, into India. Uh, you also have a training uh, facility where you are training people. And that, like you said earlier, getting the right kind of people is a big yeah. challenge. And that is a challenge across board. I mean, uh, most of the Indian companies are talking about getting, uh, you know, or get, getting people to be really becoming a bigger and bigger problem. In terms of that, how competitive is the, the space here? Because a lot of companies, yeah. Indian companies as well as international, are looking at the digital space in a big way, whether it's Larsen and Dubro, Reliance or, uh, you know, the international players. So how difficult is it to get the right kind of people? It is a war for talents. 
and and as many people say, and Sylvia said as well, um, the the question who won is is already no question anymore. The talent spawn. So and this goes. We have to differentiate. We have apprenticeship. We have vocational training for people who are working on the shop floor, but again, using new technologies, uh, programming robots and the like, that's what's happening. So this is one dimension. The other one dimension is really software developers, even high-end systems architects, very tough markets um, because many, many companies are going to India to, to look for that, um, for, for this kind of uh, skills. And you obviously have the hot spot, Bangalore, which is really hot. It's getting hotter each day. So there might be other places which are growing faster. So we have to look also into way how it should we then branch out and looking for other places that's, that's happening as we speak. But still, they, it's, a, it's a young generation. There are a lot of people coming into, into the market. And uh, if we train them properly, I think we have a, we have a good, good way to hire good people. But it's, it's tight. One thing, I think we have it a little bit easier because Siemens is still a strong brand also. And we can show to the people which we hire that we create impact for society. We do something good. We transform the everyday of many, many of billions of people. And that's what people like. So they, uh, they join us. You met Prime Minister Modi some time back. Well, I mean, it was very well reported on the kind of conversations that happened. I want to ask you that if we, if you were to get him one on one right now, what would be the one advice you may give him, you know, to help uh, uh, companies, uh, you know, uh, to kind of align themselves with the kind of aspirations India has? I mean, I think my my spontaneous point would be keep on going uh, what you did in the in the last years because it really makes a big difference. We see a lot of traction in the market, which is thanks to government investments. I do believe um, the strategy is right, investing in the energy and in the, in the uh, infrastructure, because once you have energy and infrastructure, you can add industry, also high quality of industry. That's a very good one. I would encourage also to continue to, to, to this high tech made in India. So to, to add more of this, of this high tech uh, products into India, it's worthwhile doing that. Um, I don't know whether he needs uh, any, any other advice from my side, but, uh, but keep on going. And what I also would say is it's very good to have good quality people in his, in his ministries. Um, they make a difference. You have, you have, uh, uh, you know, you interact with uh, your uh, colleagues across the world on a regular basis and sitting in Europe, what is your understanding of how this year is going to pan out? Because last few years have been uh, extremely volatile in terms of what is happening in the energy market. What's happening in the geopolitical situation? I mean, uh, I don't want to sit here and do crystal ball gazing, but generally, what would be a realistic expectation in terms of demand overall? So, I do believe 2023 will be definitely not as bad as we predicted um, a year ago, how 2023 would look like. Reasons we, we discussed, it's, it's a big order backlog, it's a supply chain which is easing, which is a very, very low unemployment rate in different places. Um, looking forward, I think we have to look very much into the, into the inflation uh, discussion. Is the inflation keeping on that high level, which would dampen the private consumption that has a key going effect? We have, to, we have to watch that carefully. And um, actually, I, I do believe if we have a more positive attitudes um, that we can do, and that there's a lot of opportunities out there in making a transformation, um, then I'm, I'm not so much concerned. For Siemens, our markets are really getting a lot of tailwinds from these mega trends. And first and foremost, it's about digitalization, it's about sustainability. So therefore, um, I, I see it very positive. That's a good note to end on, but I have one final question to ask you. Uh, Tim Cook was in India some time back uh, and the Apple chief, I mean, besides inaugurating Apple stores, uh, did everything tr from trying the, the local cuisine, Vara Pao, to meet Indian stars and actors and actresses. What are you doing in India besides just work at the Simen Siemens uh, factory campus here in Kalwa? I'm uh, enjoying the, the great food. Uh but that's about it. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm really here to, to interact with customers, to meet our people. And uh, this is really so energizing to see what our people do here on the ground. Um, seeing the young people, the apprentices, um, what they're doing, 
what, what they learn and, and how proud they are presenting it, seeing a uh, um, 50 year old manufacturing site, which is really going full steam digital, a role model, which I can put on a, on a Hannover trade fair, and it would really be the, the showcase. So, um, that that's my time and I enjoy it. Enjoy it. So it's basically all work, but exciting. It's all work. It's all work. <laughs> Absolute. Absolute. Thank you so much, Olu, for talking to us and really appreciate your time and perspective. And uh, hope to see you soon. Your 21st yeah. trip is coming yeah. soon. Absolutely. See you again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>